Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kerry Thomas, one of the editors here at Tortoise. Um, uh, lovely to have you with us for tonight's thinking. People are already reminiscing. I can see Susie Kershaw in the chat reminiscing about school days in Wales. So um, some more of that, we hope, as well. Um, and you're very welcome to tonight's thinking with Mark Drakeford. Um, I think um, probably nobody at this stage would really want to claim credit for having had a, a good pandemic, a good crisis. But some people definitely have had a better one than others. And up there, I think at the top of that particular league table is our, our guest tonight, the First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford. Mark Drakeford. His, his popularity has risen as the crisis has gone on and his recognition as a political leader has, has skyrocketed. Now, ordinarily, I think we might not pay too much attention to those kind of polling numbers. But the reason I mentioned them tonight is because I think they have a kind of bigger meaning, a political meaning, because the, the handling of the pandemic in the devolved nations, the sense that it's been dealt with better in Cardiff and Edinburgh too than London, has become an important political fact, which will have a bearing, I suspect, on the future of the UK. So in a sense, I think Mark Drakeford's recognition is also a recognition of the Senate in Cardiff, and it's a I think you could say it's a recognition of devolution as well. We're going to talk about all the, those things, but I suspect we're looking at changes that will probably persist long after the COVID crisis is over. So COVID's on the agenda. We want to talk about the effect of Brexit on Wales and the UK. We want to talk about Wales itself, about the independence question, and what sort of shape the country will emerge from after the pandemic is over or behind us. And a bunch of other things as well. And as ever, of course, we really do want to hear from you. I'll be watching the chat. My good friend and colleague Liz Mosey will be engaging in the chat and pointing out things that are said in the chat to me so that I can bring you into the conversation as well. But um, we've got a lot of ground to cover. So um, uh, with your permission, let me um, let me kick off straight away. Um, Mark, um, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. Kerry, I, I don't know whether you begin every uh, conversation with Mavanri, but uh, I hope so, because uh, if you wanted a civilised start to the evening, we certainly had it there. Yeah, and no, we're definitely going to do it from now on. It's just, a, you know, it's, um, it's just been a matter of getting to that point. Oh, um, can, I, can I start, Mark, with a, with a story I've been told? And I, and I honestly don't know if it's true or not. Um, and I'm going to ask you that in a moment. But I... I like the story, so so I wonder if we could agree that if it's not true, that maybe we could fudge that because I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it at, um, at this stage of the of the proceedings. Um, so the story goes like this: uh, I was told that you walked into a pub recently, and that I was told everybody in the pub stood up and applauded. Now, is that true? Well, yeah, it, it is. It is half true uh, in a that sense. I, I, I wasn't actually in a pub. I was passing the uh, garden of a pub where people were eating outside uh, and uh, the reception was was very warm and very appreciative. So, so, so tell me what do you think is going on there? Well I think there's a lot of complicated things uh, going on. I think uh, the coronavirus pandemic has without a doubt led to a recognition of an appreciation of the fact that we have devolved government here in Wales. It's brought that home to people in a way that nothing else has done in the 20 year and more history of devolution. Uh, but, you know, recognition of that by itself, uh, it could be recognition that things have gone very badly. Uh, but in fact, I think that one of the things that I'm you know, most pleased about is that over the long haul of the pandemic, we've managed to go about dealing with it in Wales in a way that has kept the confidence of people in Wales at the way in which decisions made on their behalf and which have had such dramatic impact in their lives that we've been able to do that in a way that continues to command the broad uh, support of people in Wales. And, you know, if, there, if there's a single line that I have heard repeated to me most often, uh, over this summer, as I've been out and about in different parts in Wales, it is people coming up and saying, oh, we're glad we've lived in Wales over the last uh, 18 months. We feel we've been kept safe 
in Wales. And I, I think that the sort of reaction that you started with is in a way an expression of that, that uh, people have come to appreciate the fact that we are capable of making decisions on our own behalf, and we're capable of making them in a way that people feel responds to the way they would wish to see their country governed. It's, it's interesting that, isn't it? Because uh, if you look just at the numbers, so if you look at the um, uh, the, the, the rates of, uh, of number of people dying in Wales um, on the sort of ONS approved measure, the age, age standardized, I know you're a, you're a great policy watcher, the age standardized mortality rate. Actually, they're not applauding the fact that Wales has done kind of, has handled the pandemic remarkably well, because actually you, it's kind of similar to England. You could probably say that Scotland may even have done a little bit better. Um, so is that fair? And then if that is fair, what do you think they are applauding? Well, nobody would want to applaud the experience that we have gone through across the United Kingdom and certainly here in Wales over the last uh, 18 months. I, I'm very uncomfortable when uh, people put questions to me about, you know, things have gone well in the pandemic in Wales. We have lost hundreds and hundreds of people to this disease, you know, thousands of families in Wales have had their lives turned upside down for public health and economic impact reasons. So it, it is not, a, it's never about thinking that somehow we have escaped the impact of coronavirus. And it's certainly not a competition uh, between what has happened here and what's happened elsewhere in the UK. I, I, I think it is more, um, Somebody came up to me last week as I was walking around in West Wales. Uh, and what he said to me, I think, summarises a bit of this. He said, what we appreciate most is that you take us into your confidence, that you share with us the information that you've got, uh, that when there are difficult decisions to be made, uh, you don't pretend that they aren't difficult decisions, and that sometimes the information you're dealing with is quite closely balanced between going down one course uh, of action or another. So that even if people haven't always uh, agreed with what we've done, we've done our best to share with them everything that we as a cabinet know and everything that leads us to the conclusions that we, we come to. And I, I think part of the reason that people feel the way they do about the way the things have been handled is, is that we try to have had that mature relationship with people. Um, you know, I, I, I never go out saying it'll all be over by, or be over in 12 weeks, or be over by Christmas, or be over by Easter, or, you know, those sort of simplistic and sloganizing ways of trying to respond to the crisis have not been the way that we've done things in Wales. And I think in terms of public perception and public support, uh, the risk that it is, because, you know, it is a risk in making, in sharing with everybody, whatever you know, but I think it has genuinely paid off. My colleague Liz is making a point in the chat there that, that, that when she was holidaying in Nargathi in the summer, that it felt, Wales felt different from England. Do you think it has, do you think COVID and the response to COVID has shown up a kind of cultural difference between, between the, the four nations of the UK, actually? Yes, I do think I, I do think you know I I have not been to England very uh, often uh, in the last eighteen months, but when I have, I, I do notice the difference myself. Uh, we have taken a cautious approach to lifting restrictions. We've done it step by step. We've done it by reviewing the impact of what we do, and that sense of caution in the face of the experience of coronavirus is one which you can still, you know, you still detect in the way that people in Wales think about it. For every person in Wales who thinks we have gone too slowly in lifting restrictions, there are more than two people who fear that we've gone too quickly. Uh, and I, I do think you detect a difference when you're across uh, the border here, where in England, there is more of a feeling that somehow the pandemic is over. 
that uh, coronavirus is a thing of the past. And of course, it's not. It's not at all. 2,000 people a day in Wales are falling ill with the Delta variant. Uh, there may still be some unpleasant surprises along the way of coronavirus. So I think that there is a distinctly different sense of wanting to respond to it with a sense of social solidarity on the one hand and with a sense of caution uh, that unless we go on doing the things together that keep us individually safe but then contribute to the safety of others, uh, that uh, we're not out of the woods on this yet. And I, I, I don't think you detect uh, this necessarily that sense to the same extent when you're uh, across our border. Yeah, um, Mark, I mentioned in passing just now that you know you're you're a you're a famous kind of um, policy wonk. I don't mean that uh, at all pejoratively, but you are always regarded, I think, in Cardiff as the best briefed person in the room um, when you're in meetings. You know, your background is in, um, you know, you've got an ap academic background in sort of administration and, and, and politics. And um, so I just wanted to sort of suggest to you that as a matter of, I can see that politically, COVID has allowed the administrations in the devolved nations to distinguish themselves from Westminster. And, and you know, we've kind of, alluded to how politically useful that's been but as a matter of policy given your policy hat um would it not have actually been better to have handled this at a uk wide level and i say that because you know the variations in covid rates um have been as big within England as they've been between England and Wales. You could ar arguably have clearer communications if you had it on a UK-wide basis. You might have had better, better procurement, those kind of things, which were very important at times. Don't you think, as a, as, a, as a matter of policy, that actually it would have been better if it had been a single entity rather than the four? Uh, well, no, I don't. Uh, and that is because I have been, you know, throughout my political life, a convinced uh, devolutionist and you know, actual devolution has only taken place in about half of the time that I've been uh, involved in active politics and I've been a convinced believer in devolution because I genuinely believe that decisions are made best when they're made as close as you can make them to the people most directly affected and I think we've had the best of both worlds during the crisis. We have been able to rely on the strength that Wales gets through being part of the United Kingdom. And I believe in the United Kingdom. And I believe that Wales' future is better secured inside the United Kingdom. So you mentioned procurement. Well, here is a success story. The purchase of vaccine supply for the whole of the United Kingdom was best done at the UK level. The purchasing power of 60 million people in a globally competitive market is only is always going to be more effective than if you had just 3 million people uh, to buy for. But then the implementation of the vaccination programme is much better done by people who are closer to the circumstances that appertain in the four nations. We have a different health and social care system to the one in England. Uh, this is not to be critical of the way anybody else has done it, but we knew what we needed to do to make vaccination in Wales happen as fast and as effectively as we could. And we were better placed to do that. So there, people in Wales had the best of both worlds. They had the purchasing power of the whole of the United Kingdom, discharged successfully by the UK government. And then they had the on the ground understanding that the Welsh government and our partners in the NHS and in local authorities could bring to bear to make sure that we made the best and most rapid use of the vaccine supply in our own circumstances. So uh, I don't agree that decisions would have been better made on a UK basis. I think they would have been clunkier. I think they would have fitted less well with the particular needs of the component parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, and as I say, uh, I think we've been able to get the best out of our UK membership in some aspects and the best out of what devolution can provide as well.
Okay, um, I can see there's a very lively chat going on, and um, we'll try and pull someone, some people out from there as soon as we can to, to join in. And I think, you know, on these occasions, um, normally we mark, we have, we have a sort of rule for these things, which is because we don't want it to be a kind of panel show, we say no questions, we want to hear what people think, we want to hear their points of view, we want to hear their experiences, but we do occasionally suspend that, and I think we, we're happy to suspend the sort of no questions rule um, uh, tonight, if um, if people do have a question for Mark, then um, drop that in the chat, and, and we'll bring you into the conversation. Um, Mark, have you? We talked to we, we talked to, actually before the before the conversation started properly about the kind of the, the idea of of a certain modesty in Wales. If you apply that modesty, what, what are the, what, what what aspects of the pandemic do you think you could have handled better? If you're being self critical, what um, where do you think, um, in retrospect, that you might have, um, you know, you, you perhaps could have dealt with things differently? Well, look, uh, I think the important part in that question is in retrospect. Uh, I do genuinely struggle to think of major decisions that we made that we would have done differently, knowing what we knew at the time. But obviously, we knew we know an enormous amount more now than we did back in March of 2020. So I think had we known what we know now, we surely would have acted earlier uh, than we did, uh, earlier on a UK basis. So, you know, at the beginning of March, I don't think we had anticipated the speed at which coronavirus would spread through the population. I don't think we had anticipated the impact that some large-scale events would have uh, on the spread of the virus. And had we known then what we know now, we would have acted sooner and we would have taken actions in some particular instances more quickly. I think if we'd known that in November of 2020 uh, that there was a new variant already in Wales, which would be considerably more transmissible uh, than the original uh, coronavirus, then I think we would have emerged from our autumn lockdown uh, more slowly than we did, but we didn't know. You know, the, the, the Kent variant was already seeded in Wales in November, and we didn't know about it until, you know, a couple of weeks beyond that. So when you look back in retrospect, when you think of what we now know, of course there are decisions that we would have probably taken differently. But that is with a considerable benefit of information that we didn't have at the time. Yeah. And back, you mentioned the, the very early days of the pandemic and, and that decision about when to lock down. There's been a tremendous amount of criticism of Boris Johnson for, for delaying. Were you at that point in, so this is March 2020, were you actively considering locking down Wales earlier than that. Presumably, that, you know, as First Minister, that would have been in your power to, to take that decision. Did, did, you, did you consider an earlier lockdown? No, I uh, couldn't uh, say that we did. And it's important to remember the way in which coronavirus spread across the United Kingdom, because actually at the time that we locked down in Wales, we were not seeing the full impact of coronavirus. You know, I, I, it was the position in London, I thought at the time, that had persuaded the Prime Minister that action of the sort that was taken was taken. Coronavirus was moving uh, west and north. We were already beginning to see its impact in the southeast corner of Wales, uh, the part closest to the border. But there were whole parts of Wales which had barely had a case of coronavirus at all at the point in which uh, the first lockdown was introduced. So I couldn't say at all that we, you know, we had considered a, a Wales only lockdown in advance back in March of uh, 2020, because the facts on the ground, I don't think would have put us in that position. I don't think we could have explained it to people in Wales, large parts of Wales not having cases at all, why we were taking that action when they were parts of the United Kingdom, where coronavirus was much, much more uh, prevalent already, and where 
such an approach wasn't thought to be necessary. Yeah, okay. Um, there's obviously, um, Mark, there's a lot of interest in the chat in sort of wider questions about what, what this done to the, to, the, to the shape and the future of the UK. So I think we'll probably turn to that now. And I'm interested actually in, in what it's been like, what the experience of dealing with Boris Johnson in particular has been like through the last uh, year and a half. So I'm sorry, I didn't warn you about this, but I'm just going to play a little clip. Um, I think my colleague George is going to play it of, of, of some comments you made in an S4C documentary um, that didn't get a lot of play in London when it went out early this year. But um, this is a sort of fly on the wall S4C documentary about the handling of the pandemic in Wales. And I think um, the, the bit we're about to see, Mark, just you, you've just come out of a meeting with Boris Johnson when, um, when they catch you here. Dear me, he really, really is awful. Imagine that some deadly new variant of the virus had been discovered in France and they were trying to persuade us that there was no need to take any action to stop uh, French lorry drivers from driving across the continent. Do you need anything to tell me to the waiter? Uh, no, I don't think there's anything at all, other than wringing our hands in a sense of despair. Mark, thanks for bearing us with us, wearing with us through that. What what has it done to your to your sense of what, what, what have you learned, I suppose, about the view from Westminster of Wales through the way that you've, through those interactions with um, Boris Johnson and, and, and other members of the government in, in London? Well, uh, probably important to preface this by saying that for the first time in devolution, we are dealing with a Conservative government that has a uh, untrammeled working majority. Uh, and I'm afraid, I think that that has brought to the surface a set of latent uh, beliefs about devolution in the United Kingdom that we've never had to deal with uh, before. I mean, I've dealt with a number of uh, conservative uh, ministers and indeed uh, worked uh, with Theresa May when she was prime minister. And I think there has been a qualitative difference in relationships across the United Kingdom since December 2019. I, I, I'm very important for me not to sound like I'm just complaining and that everything is bad. That's not the case. Below the surface, an awful lot of day in, day out interaction goes on perfectly uh, successfully. Uh, and it is still possible to have meetings with some UK ministers where you feel there is a genuine understanding of devolution and where devolution is regarded as one of the building blocks of the United Kingdom, not one of the uh, great mistakes of the United Kingdom. But inside the current uh, UK government, there is you know, a more significant strand than ever before of people who genuinely do take that view, uh, who wish they could roll the clock back you know, to before the European Union uh, and to before devolution as well, who would like the United Kingdom to look like it did, you know, around 1973 or 1974, uh, and uh, act, you know, uh, accordingly. Now, unfortunately, this is not just, uh, you know, flying in the face of, uh, of history, but it is much, much more likely con to contribute to the fissures that exist inside the United Kingdom than to find a future for the United Kingdom in which people in all four component parts of the United Kingdom would choose positively uh, to be part of it in the future. And in a way, my biggest, my biggest uh, disappointment or quarrel, if you want to put it in that way, with the Prime Minister is, is that I don't doubt that he does what he does believe in that he is securing the future of the United Kingdom. But actually what he is doing you know, every day, I think, is to add to the tensions, to strengthen the arm of those people who want to argue that Scotland uh, and indeed Wales will be better off 
uh, separated from it. So, uh, and what had he done to upset you like that? Well, I think there is this sort of muscular unionism approach that has taken hold uh, in uh, Downing Street. Uh, a belief that the problem of the United Kingdom is that the United Kingdom itself has not shouted uh, loud enough, that it's somehow sort of you know, left the field and left devolved administrations to capture the, uh, the imaginations and the, uh, and the political preferences of people who live in the different parts of the UK. And what we therefore need is for the United Kingdom to reassert itself. Uh, to bang its chest uh, a bit louder, to insist, uh, as they do in Cardiff at the moment, in flying, you know, a Union Jack, the half the size of the Empire State Building, uh, from uh, a new UK government office that has suddenly appeared in the centre uh, of the city. Um, that, that, that sort of you know, imperialist sense of what the union is about actually creates more people who don't wish to be associated with it than make people feel oh this is you know this is the the project that i want to be associated with so there's a lot of symbolic stuff that i think people find counterproductive and offensive i don't it's not intended to do that i don't suppose but that is the practical effect of it but it's i can see it I'd like to bring Derek Cody in in a minute, if we can, if we can bring Derek up, just because he's been wondering a little bit about the future of the UK and the light of Wales and what happens if Scotland becomes independent. I'd like to sort of just bring bring Derek into the conversation. But I guess, Mark, it's it's not an easy balancing act, is it? If you're you're in favour of a confident union, um, but you balk at a um, at something that looks imperialist or sort of domineering. Um, perhaps we can. Perhaps that's not easy if you're sitting in in Westminster to to calibrate. Uh, well, I, I think there are ways of uh, of doing it, uh, and those are ways that emphasise the fact that the union is a union of social solidarity, uh, in which we all make our contribution and we all draw out according to our needs, and that by acting collectively in that way. Uh, we end up stronger than if we try and act alone. I think there is a, you know, I think there is a strong narrative about the United Kingdom, but it doesn't rely on flag waving and it doesn't rely on, you know, uh, positioning the uh, BBC Light Orchestra on the border to play choruses of Rule Britannia. Uh, and if that's all there is, you know, if, if that's what the Prime Minister has got in his locker, uh, then I'm afraid, you know, we're we're in pretty difficult times. Well, if that's all there is, then a, you know, you know, if you're a you're a devolutionist unionist, if 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 that's all there is, then the risk, I suppose, is that you're part of a dying breed. Well, um, you know, I, I think that was put a test to the test very clearly in our election here in May, more clearly, I think, than ever uh, in the history of devolution. I used to have to take part in debates. Uh, on the different broadcast channels. Uh, on one side of me stood the leader of the Abolish, uh, the Assembly Party, as it was called, uh, who argued that devolution was a mistake, that we would be better off uh, you know, returning to a more unitary state, uh, approach in which decisions for Wales would be made at uh, Westminster. Uh, on the other side of me was the leader of Plaid Cymru, who in a way that you know, it was quite different to earlier elections, put independence front and center and top of the agenda, uh, were that party to be uh, elected. And uh, I was the voice of uh, the perspective that said, we need a strong entrenched devolution, but in a successful United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I think, the results demonstrated that that is still where the centre of gravity in Welsh political life is to be found. Uh, there's also there's always an attractiveness in views that are more at the ends of the spectrum because you know they give colour and uh, copy to journalists. But when people in Wales 
had the choice put in front of them as unambiguously as it ever has been, they made their choice, you know, with no ambiguity at all. Okay. Um, Derek Cody, are you there? Because I was interested in something in points you were making in the chat earlier on. We able to hey, you? Yeah. Oh, hi, Derek. Thanks for joining us. Um, you were looking at this from the sort of from a sort of um, perspective of what happens, what, what will happen to the UK if Scotland leads a charge towards independence? What, what's your what's your sort of theory of the game there? Well, I'm a, I'm a Welshman living in Wales, but work most of my career in England, but also worked for a few years in Scotland. So you know, you you, you gain you gain an awareness of the commonality between Scotland and Wales in terms of its cultures and its its community closeness and, and its values. And I think one of the issues going forward is that. I've always understood the Scottish issue being about, well, Westminster just doesn't reflect Scottish values. But within the UK, Wales has a very limited political clout and a very limited political voice, you know, sort of uh, how independent of how able our political leadership is, you know, sort of, uh, but we combined with Scotland, there's some representation of common values within Westminster. And I guess I see the day that, you know, so if Scotland does retain, you know, gain, gain independence, then Wales will look a very odd pimple um, uh, within with, within the UK and, 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 a, and a very difficult fit. I think, yeah, the, uh, Derek, thanks so much. So, Mark, that's true, isn't it? If Scotland were to, to, to leave, then do you take it as automatic that Wales would leave too because it wouldn't want to look like, a, as, as Derek said, an odd pimple? I don't take it as automatic, but what I do take uh, as automatic is in the way the point that I thought Derek was making, that if Scotland were to leave the United Kingdom, nobody should imagine that what is left just carries on uh, in an unquestioned sort of way. Uh, I hope Scotland doesn't leave. You know, I'm a socialist myself. I believe the interests of working people in Wales have a strong identity with the interests of working people in England, Scotland and Northern Ireland, and that we're better off uh, acting collectively to advance the interests of working people. But if Scotland were to leave, then you know, Wales would have to be in a position of thinking through the options that remained for us. And the pimple option you know, ha is not immediately attractive, is it? You know, next, look, look, this is how hard it is, isn't it? Next year, it will be a hundred years since Labour first won a majority in a general election in Wales. In 1922, remember 1922, in the general election of that year, for the first time ever, Labour won more than half the seats in Wales, overtaking the Liberals who dominated our politics in the 19th century. We've never not been in that position ever since. Election after election, people in Wales prefer make a conscious choice of voting for parties that are on the left of the political centre. And yet, you know, for long periods, we have had governments that don't reflect that, uh, that point of view. Now, if we were in a position where you could never see the day in which that would be different, then there will be some very hard thinking that will be needed in Wales as to the future the people in Wales would prefer in such circumstances. Circumstances I hope will not arise, of course. Derek, does that seem, does that seem viable to you? I think the, the, the pimple is a, is a great way of putting it because it's so unattractive. Does that, do, do you share Mark's optimism that there might be a sort of redrawn UK that could keep Wales in at that point? Or, or is your sense that actually the die will be cast? I, I, I think. The die would be cast. I think that um, I'd like to think that Mark's optimism would um, would follow through. But uh, we've always struggled, and, and, and it would mean I was difficult for Mark to comment on, on on these things. But Wales has always struggled for a political voice in in Westminster as, as long as I can, obviously as long as I can remember. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, it is this issue of, and he touched on it, this issue of. A, um, a different set of values in Westminster to the values that exist exist in Wales, and um, 
Um, I do see that I think um, I've never been a, 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 a um, applied voter, but I do see a distinctive possible trend um, developing in, in Wales or or we just simply wash our hands and say, well, yeah, and we start to see another period in which we start to lose Welsh identity. I think you know, sort of Welsh identity has been prospering. Um, and Derek, have you got more open to the idea of Welsh independence in the last few years? Because that's been that's been a trend within Wales, within yes, the yeah, Labour Party yeah. in Wales as well as elsewhere. Yeah, I, I, in some of the things that Mark has said, I mean, sort of, uh, I, I do resonate towards English. I, I do respond in a negative way to English nationalism. And I, I, I see more and more of it every day and, and every day it gets me more and more wound up. <laughs> Um, okay, let me, um, Margaret Hughes, are you there? Hi, Katie. Hello, Margaret. Thanks for joining us. Hello, uh, thank you. Are you in Scotland? Yes, I'm in Glasgow. So, um, so I went to university in Wales. So it's a country, I went to university in Cardiff. So it's a country that I feel very close to and very fond of and watch. And watch with real interest actually their devolution journey alongside Scotland's devolution journey. And they've been quite different, I think, in lots of respects. So one of the points you were making in the chat actually interests me because I've got a kind of working theory about the Labour Party and, and uh, nationalism, which is that the, the Labour Party struggles when it's confronted with a nationalist opponent. And that's definitely been the case in, in Scotland. And you could argue that in a different way, it's been the case in um, across the north of England as well, as, as there's been a sort of rise in, in English nationalist sentiment in, uh, in northern England. Um, Labour's, Labour's really struggled there. Um, that's not quite the picture in Wales. So do, do you think there's something that Labour in Scotland could learn from something in from, from Labour in Wales? I think that there's... <laughs> There's something that Labour in Scotland and the UK can learn from something in Labour in Wales, and that is how to win elections, because they've spectacularly failed to do so in both the UK and in Scotland for a long time. And I think if we'd gone back, you know, a few years ago, maybe a decade ago, the monolith that was the Scottish Labour Party, one would never have predicted that it would it would never not be a dominant force in, in Scottish politics. And I think we could safely say that it has quite sadly become that. Like Mark, I am a socialist and feel quite politically homeless at the moment. Um, and, and, and against that juggernaut of independence. And, and personally, I think that the Labour Party in Scotland needs to find a way to to make it possible to, to basically accept if the will of the Scottish people is independence, then the Labour Party needs to find its place within that. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how the Labour Party, perhaps in Scotland, learns to advance that notion and that argument. But I think really fundamentally, what I want is a Labour Party that's electable again. So therefore, I look at Wales and I think, what are they doing so well there that the, the Labour Party and the, the rest of the UK clearly find so challenging? Margaret, thank you. Um, Mark, let me come back to you, because I, I, as you were speaking earlier on about the, the sort of the new, the new sort of confidence in devolution, the new recognition of devolution, the new sense of a sort of Welsh political identity that might have come out of the, the pandemic. There's part of me that's wondering whether, whether actually you're a little bit worried that you've let a genie out of a bottle there, because um, you can look at where Margaret is in Scotland and, and, and there are similarities with parts of Wales where there's been a sort of built in Labour majority, you know, across that belt in, in, in the south of Wales, particularly for forever and a day. Um, so some of the circumstances look similar. Do you, do you think you can, can you, can you control this thing now, now it's out there? Well, I think you, you've got to try and uh, do a number of things, which is what we have tried to do uh, in Wales. Uh, first of all, you know, my message to my party from the day that I became the leader of Welsh Labour was that we have to earn every vote that we get. And, you know, Margaret referred to Scottish Labour as a sort of monolithic party. And uh, you know, 
I don't think we can ever afford in Wales to make anybody feel that we simply take their vote for granted. And do, do you uh, think wherever they are, in some parts of Wales at some points. Yeah, I think you know there, there are periods in in the history of the Labour Party where you may think that people uh, did feel that you know Labour was an inevitable uh, winner at the polls. And my message to my party is we should never approach elections in that way. Every election is an opportunity to re-cement the relationship that there is between the Labour Party uh, and people in Wales. And we have a responsibility to work hard every day to earn the confidence that uh, that they show in us. So, you know, never take a single vote for granted in any single part of Wales. That's my starting point. I think the next thing that we try to do in Wales, and it is easier for us because Wales remains, you know, a Labour country, is that we put a manifesto in front of people in Wales, which is authentically Labour. We don't attempt to win people's votes by trying to sort of capture ground that isn't ours, by trying to look as though we are something we are not. We have you know, our manifesto was an authentically Labour manifesto based on the belief that we all do better when we act collectively to develop solutions to common problems and that those collective solutions reach deepest into the lives of those people who need those solutions the most and that those people should be at the top of the list of people that we are concerned about uh, and the policies that we develop flow from that basic set of uh, beliefs. So uh, I think authenticity, being genuinely Labour, has stood us in good stead in Wales. And then I think just thirdly, we have worked very hard in the whole of the devolution period to create circumstances in which people in Wales feel confident that to be Welsh and to be Labour are identities that sit absolutely comfortably one with the other. You do not have to vote for a nationalist party in Wales to prove that you are Welsh. But you know, Welsh Labour is as passionately uh, determined to be the voice of Wales and the embodiment of that Welsh culture and experience uh, as any other party would be. And I think in some parts, you know, that ground was ceded to too readily, and we've worked very hard indeed to make sure we don't see that ground in Wales. Um, when you repeat that phrase about being authentically Labour, uh, I understand it, but it, it does sound, at the same time as you're saying it, uh, uh, it does come across as something of a warning to, to Keir Starmer. Well, I, I tried to preface what I said by saying, you know, that it is easier for us to be in that position because there is a coalition of voters in Wales already who are in that position. You know, a hundred years uh, of people voting uh, in majorities for Labour gives you a different backcloth against which to create the coalition that you need in order to uh, continue to exercise power on behalf of people. Keir is in a different position to that. He has a wider electorate to think about. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I don't for a minute think that I'm going to try and uh, tell him that he should copy what we've done in Wales in a simplistic way. What I do think the party at a national level needs to do, however, uh, is to do more to persuade those people who we look to to vote for us that we are genuinely on their side and that we like them. You know, we identify with them. We're proud to represent them. Uh, we're not slightly shamefaced about some of the people who uh, we look to for, for support. Uh, and all the three things I said, you know, earning every vote, speaking in the authentic uh, voice of Labour, making sure that people's willingness to see their political identity and their local identity as, you know, closely aligned with the Labour Party, uh, I think there's something in every bit of that uh, that can help to create a more effective recipe for Labour across the UK. You still think Jeremy Corbyn would have made a good Prime Minister? Oh, 
you know, I voted for Jeremy Corbyn uh, because I believed that the policies that he wanted to promote inside the Labour Party were those authentic Labour policies. Uh, I've never been proud uh, to have knocked doors for the Labour Party and I was in 2017 uh, on our manifesto there. And you know, thinking what I, what I was saying about the authentic voice of Labour, let me tell you just one very brief story. We started uh, in my constituency here in Cardiff, like in the rest of the United Kingdom, Labour 20% behind in the opinion polls, uh, thinking this was going to be a very difficult election indeed. Uh, and I sometimes think, where did the point come when I thought that maybe things were not going to be as we had feared? And it was when I was knocking doors one morning in the Canton part of Cardiff, the inner city part of Cardiff, a long street which sort of starts in Cardiff and ends in Barry, it feels, when you start to knock those doors. Well, halfway down it, uh, this uh, lady, I'm sure she would have said, in, certainly in her 80s, came to the door. And I did my normal stuff, you know, calling behalf of the Labour Party, hope you'll be thinking of voting uh, for us. And she said to me, well, uh, I had been thinking of voting Labour. And she sort of stopped. I thought, all right, OK, well, I'll, uh, I'll keep going. I said, oh, well, you know, have you ever voted for uh, Labour in the past? She says, yes, I've uh, done that. I thought, well, I'll have one more go. I said, so, you know, what can we say to help persuade you to vote for us again this time? She said, well, she said. I've seen your manifesto. And I thought to myself, this is the Labour Party I've been waiting for, and I'll be voting Labour. And at that point, I suddenly thought to myself, there is something going on here. The fact that we have published a manifesto that has those ideas that are authentically Labour uh, is speaking to people in a way that maybe we hadn't realised and was having a reach into parts of the community that maybe we didn't expect it to have. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I desperately wish that we had succeeded that final push back in 2017 to get that Labour government elected uh, to do the things that we would have been able to do. OK, uh, Mark, thank you. I, I, I want to bring Owen McArdle in, if you're there, Owen, because you were just picking up in the chat on that. Um, and I think you're doing it from a sort of applied Cumbry point of view um, about that question of whether the, the genie is out of the bottle in Wales. What's your, just give us your readout on that. I think we need to unmute Owen by the look of it. It's not. All right. Owen, I mean, try again, because I think you're unmuted now. All right, something's not working there. We'll come back to you. We'll come back to you. Um, Mark, while we're sorting out Owen Sound, um, we, we did want to talk about Brexit a bit in this conversation. And I think Wales is interesting in, in Brexit because um, uh, people have been asking this question in the chat. Actually, the, the, in 2016, what the, the Welsh nation was the most, well, actually, I think the closest to the sort of 52, 48 leave vote of all the constituent nations of the UK. So so you are so whereas in Scotland um, you could argue that both the Brexit vote and the handling of COVID are sort of pushing in the same direction, pushing perhaps tending to push towards separation. Um, in Wales you're dealing with sort of different circumstances that, that, that you know you the Wales voted to leave. Um, so that's sort of Perhaps putting in one direction, while whilst COVID is putting in another. But but if you look around now, um, how is that combination of Brexit and COVID hitting the Welsh economy uh, at the moment? Uh, well, the Welsh economy is recovering from coronavirus more quickly than we had probably feared. Uh, our unemployment levels remain below those of the United Kingdom. Uh, our economic inactivity levels, which were by some distance the highest in the UK back in 1999, are now uh, back more or less in the UK uh, ballpark. Um, but uh, the Brexit chickens, I think, are coming home to roost in Wales as elsewhere. Uh, we've had some, you know, hugely uh, directly difficult experiences. Um, the, uh, the 
muscle industry of North Wales, a very successful industry built up over 20 years, often with European investment to uh, help with that development is effectively over. Uh, it simply cannot trade uh, in the new circumstances. Uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol means the trade between Holyhead uh, and uh, I, the island of Ireland and between Fishguard and Pembroke Dock has been very badly affected and has not recovered at all to anything like pre-Brexit uh, levels. And we're affected as everybody else is by you know, acute shortages of staff in our social care sector, where people have returned to the European uh, Union and shortages on the shelves of uh, supermarkets are a reality here in Wales as elsewhere. And we have the longer term threats uh, come from a government uh, who is prepared to neglect our closest and most important market in the European Union uh, in pursuit of nugatory uh, deals with parts of the world you know, far, far away. And in the process is willing to make casualties of, for example, uh, the hill farming industry here in Wales. The Australian trade deal and the trade deal that is being pursued more generally with the Pacific uh, Rim countries, uh, th th there's just no other way of reading it other than the long term interests of that very, very important part of uh, the Welsh economy because it is also part of our culture and our language and our history uh, that that has been sacrificed in pursuit of deals that do do very very little for the real economy of wales and threaten by agreeing to different standards in different parts of the world with our ability long term to go on trading with our nearest and most important market so Brexit has been a painful experience in Wales. Uh, the Welsh Government, I think immediately after the vote, you know, we said, and this has always been my mantra, the fact of Brexit is decided. You know, however we may think about it ourselves, the fact of Brexit is decided. It's the form of Brexit that we focused on, and it's the form of Brexit that the UK government has got so badly wrong. And so if you look at um Brexit and the handling of the pandemic as these two potentially sort of centrifugal forces on the UK. In the end, do you think that Brexit, despite the fact that Wales voted to leave, do you think that might be the stronger of those two sort of potentially centrifugal forces? Uh, well, I think you've got to look at it in the context of each nation. So I think Brexit is particularly, uh, you know, salient in the Northern Irish context. So Northern Ireland also voted to stay in the European Union, despite the fact that, you know, unionist parties were opposed to it. Uh, and I think that tells you something about the changing nature of uh, politics in the north of Ireland. Uh, and obviously they have, you know, right by them with a the land border, a country which is still part of the European Union, and you can see it there in front of you every day. Then you have the decision of the prime minister, despite having gone to Belfast to say that you know, never in a thousand years would he agree to a border down the Irish Sea. Uh, he hopped back across the channel and did exactly that. And you know, the, the extent to which that has done enormous damage to relationships with the unionist community uh, should, should not be underestimated at all. Uh, I, I spent last weekend with the British Irish Association annual conference in uh, in Oxford, where the Taoiseach and the Foreign Minister of the Republic were there, the First Minister and Sinn Féin ministers from the Executive were there, and, you know, uh, Northern Ireland is a changing place, and Brexit is much closer to the engine room of that change than it would be in Wales, I think. And Scotland, as you know, every single part of Scotland voted to remain in the European Union and yet has been taken out of the European Union as the government of Scotland would certainly say against the wishes of the Scottish people and maybe when when as we we hope uh, sometime reasonably soon the pandemic is in the rear view mirror uh, the Brexit experience will continue to be you know part of the the fissures 
that you can see in relationships in the UK. Yeah. But you must be worried, Mark, because if 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 COVID, um, I think what you know, the kind of cliche of COVID is that it's going to be an accelerant of trends that we saw before. Uh, and 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 given what you've described, I think we we knew post twenty sixteen that Wales was likely to be one of the parts of the UK most hard hit by the decision to leave. Combination of those two things on on a Welsh economy that actually was underperforming relative to the rest of the UK before twenty sixteen. Um, that's a pretty toxic mix, isn't it? That that th th there's a real job ahead for you economically yeah. to try to, to 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 stop Wales really suffering in the next few years. Yeah, of course. You know the. Um... Uh, in terms of the European Union, uh, Wales is particularly exposed because a higher percentage of our economy is in manufacturing. And we see now all the barriers to trade for manufacturing. Uh, and a higher percentage of our economy is in the production of uh, agricultural uh, goods. And uh, as I said, you know, we've got stark examples of how that has been made more difficult. So. Uh, Brexit does produce a series of headwinds for the Welsh economy. Uh, coronavirus, I, I hope, will be less so. You know, we appear at the moment to be in a fairly classic V-shaped uh, recovery. And there are things that we can do as a Welsh government to try to make sure that, you know, as we emerge from uh, the coronavirus experience, that we are positioning the Welsh economy particularly in terms of the skills of the people that uh, we have here, as well as the quality of life that we offer, uh, that will make Wales's economic future more secure. The biggest part of that has to come, I believe, uh, through the development of the natural assets we have in the other crisis, which is, you know, the, the global climate change crisis, where Wales's geography means that we have on our side some things that we haven't had on our side in the 60 years uh, since, you know, the, the coal and steel dimensions of uh, industrial revolutions began to count against us. So we have waves, we have wind, we have water, uh, and all of those things mean that our ability to be contributors to the energy that the whole of the United Kingdom will need uh, post the end, you know, once fossil fuel extraction uh, comes to an end, I think there are a series of genuine assets that Wales has uh, as economic drivers. And our job is to make the very most of them and to position ourselves to take the best advantage of the things that are now on our side economically and haven't been on our side for half a century. Okay. Mark, I've, I hadn't even noticed. We, we are out of time, I'm really sorry to oh. say. Um, it has flown by. Just as a, um, there was some speculation in the chat while, we were, um, while you and I were talking about um, sort of degrees of optimism about the UK holding together over the next uh, generation. How, how, optimistic do you feel just as a final question about you know the UK still being as it is in or, or you know uh, a political entity in in 25 years look I think the slope is getting steeper um so I think uh you know those of us who believe in the United Kingdom are right to be anxious about it but I do believe that there is a compelling story to be told uh, that would make people in the whole of the United Kingdom want to be part of it. Uh, we don't have a government that tells that story. We have a government that tells a, you know, a very different story, and as I would see it, a counterproductive story. But we shouldn't confuse the temporary occupation of power by a particular group of people uh, with the long-term interests of the United Kingdom. Uh, and, uh, you know, I look forward to the next election. I hope it offers us different opportunities, because when we do articulate a United Kingdom as a great insurance policy in which we are all able to make a contribution, but are all able to draw out of that insurance policy to meet the different needs that we have, 
where the sense of the things that bind us are foregrounded rather than the things that uh, divide us. And that we think of the United Kingdom as a voluntary association of four nations where we choose, we choose to pool our sovereignty for certain common purposes. I think there's a story there still to be told uh, and that it's not too late to tell it. But the, the time to get serious about it is now. Well, that's a great note to end on. Um, George, if you want to just sort of gently bring up Mavanwi again as we as we close the discussion, I think we'd all really like that. So if, um, if that's technically possible, then do. Um, while I'm saying thank you to Mark, um, you've been generous with your time, generous with your thoughts. And um, I've, I think it's, there's an optimism. You know, actually, it's interesting talking to you for, for a decent amount of time because I think one of the, one of the sort of caricatures of you before COVID, and perhaps through it as well, would be not as a sort of optimistic politician, a kind of you know, a technocrat, and a um, um, but not in the mould of sort of you know breast beating uh, sort of Nye Bevan, Neil Kinnock, Audrey Morgan kind of you know. Um, but, but actually, there's, there's, a, there's a really encouraging sense of optimism about the future of the UK that I think we've, we've heard there at the end, in spite of the challenges of Wales and in spite of the, um, the challenges that um, uh, dealing with the four nations of the UK through this um, has presented to you. So um, great to hear that. Great to have your company. Uh, thanks, everyone else, for, for joining us. Thank you.